Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve as he continues his new powerful series, Life is Hard, But God is Good. Are you living a victorious life in Christ powered by the Spirit of God in you? If not, learn how to today in a message entitled, A Declaration of Devotion. Now, in Psalm 101, we read of David's declaration of devotion, David's stake in the ground, so to speak. David is setting up his kingdom in Jerusalem. Saul was king, and then Saul's son for a short time, and now David is king. And the the dynasty has passed from the house of Saul now to the house of David. And this is what David says. It's kind of his manifesto for his life, for his family, and for his kingdom. Verse 1, I will sing of loving kindness and justice. To thee, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will give heed to the blameless way. When will you come to me? I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. My eyes shall look upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. He who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. Every morning I will destroy, I will silence all the wicked of the land so as to cut off from the city of the Lord all those who do iniquity. A declaration of devotion. Eight times in the New American Standard, David makes the statement, I will, 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 I will. Hey, you know, we talk about willpower This is how willpower works in the Christian life. You provide the will and God provides the power. But when you don't provide the will, you're not connected to the power. And so we need to make that declaration of devotion. We need to drive a stake in the ground and say, this is the direction that I am going. So the question today, will you join King David in a declaration of devotion? Now, there are four areas that he talks about in this text that we just read, and four areas that you and I need to declare our devotion. Area number one, declare your unwavering allegiance to the Lord. I will sing of loving kindness and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. Sing to loving kindness and justice. That describes God. God is the God of love. God is the God who is holy, holy, holy. And the scripture says, Psalm 89, verse uh, 14, righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you. God's throne, righteousness and justice, and right in front of God's throne, there's loving kindness and truth. Those are four key components of God's character. And David's saying right off the bat, Lord, I'm surrendering myself, my kingdom to you. I want my kingdom to be under your kingdom and your kingdom to rule my kingdom so it would be a kingdom of loving kindness and justice just the way you run your kingdom. That is important. Now, in the Christian life, we come before the Lord every day as believers. You know, you only have to pray to receive Christ one time. You pray and receive Christ and and you become a Christian And you're transferred, the Bible says, he delivered me from the domain of darkness and transferred me into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That happens one time. But every single day we need to come before the Lord and re-up. We need to come before the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. 
I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Lord, here I am. I've been bought with a price. I am your servant. I surrender today. I want you to be Lord of all in me. That's a declaration of unwavering allegiance to the Lord. Second area, declare your total commitment to a life of purity. Total commitment to a life of purity. Look at verse 2. I will give heed to the blameless way. When will you come to me? I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. The blameless way is the way of integrity. And the word in the New American Standard that is blameless, and then the word at the end of this verse with, that uh, says integrity, those come from the same root. And that word basically means completeness and wholeness. And God wants us to make a declaration that we're going to be people of integrity. Now, that, what does that mean in practical terms? It means you are solid and whole. You are true blue. You are a person who has principles and convictions. It is said that beliefs are something we hold, but convictions uh, hold us. And you're a person that says, these are non-negotiables for me. I, I have conviction about this, and I am going to walk in the ways of the Lord. Now, David didn't say, I will walk in the sinless way. He said, I'm going to walk in the blameless way, the way of integrity. Nobody walks in the sinless way. There is not a person on the planet who doesn't ever sin. We still sin, but here's the thing. God is not concerned about every situation in life in terms of the perfection of your life. Because if God's concerned about the perfection of your life, you fail, I fail, we fail, the apostle Paul fails, everybody fails. But God is more concerned about the direction of your life. God wants to see you move on with him. God wants to see you grow with him. And God wants to see you drive a stake in the ground and say, I'm going to start living a life of integrity. Integrity. It means you're solid and whole. Integrity, secondly, means you're consistent in public and private. David says, I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. Within my house, when no one's around. You know, you, you present yourself as one way in public, you're the king, but then you go home and you take off your crown and you take off your royal robes and you, you put on your comfortable clothes. And then what kind of a guy are you, David? He said, I'm going to walk with integrity when I'm in my house, when I'm all alone, when no one can see me, when I go on a business trip and I'm in a city that nobody knows who I am and I'm in the hotel room, I'm going to be the same guy that I am up front. That's what David was saying. That was the stake he was driving into the ground. Hey, your public life and your private life, if you have integrity, those are intact. And you're the same guy, same girl, when you're out in public as you are in private. Now, that doesn't mean you don't ever sin. We know, as we read David's manifesto, that he, he didn't do this perfectly. I mean, he sinned greatly with Bathsheba and then with Uriah the Hittite. And there were consequences for that sin. But here's what David is saying. It's not the perfection of your life, it's the direction of your life. And David said, I want to go in this direction where my public life, my private life, and my secret life, they're all in the light together. They're all in sync together before the Lord. I don't want to be a veneer over particle board Christian. I want to be a solid wood Christian. So declare your total commitment to a life of integrity. Thirdly, declare your complete victory over sin and perversity. He says in verse 3, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. David said, I'm not going to set any worthless thing, any Good for nothing thing before my eyes. And he says, a perverse heart is not going to stay with me. It's going to depart from me. A perverse heart is a heart that is twisted, that is crooked, that takes good things and perverts things. Now, notice this. There's a connection 
between your heart and your eyes. Connection between those things. I'll put no worthless thing before my eyes. A perverse heart shall depart from me. Case in point, Lot's wife. You know, here are the angels sent to Lot in Sodom. They're going down to see, is, is Sodom as wicked as the report has said? And they find out it's, it's even worse than the report. It's horrible. And so they tell Lot, God is going to destroy this city with fire and brimstone from heaven. Lot, get your wife and get your daughters and let's get out of here. And Lot hesitated and the compassion of the Lord was on Lot. And the angel grabbed Lot's hand and he says, come on, we're leaving. And then the angel warned them. Do not look back. When the fire and brimstone fall, do not look back. And as they're fleeing, Lot's wife is behind Lot, and the scripture says she turned back, and she looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. She was consumed in the judgment. Why did she look back? Because her heart was still there in Sodom. She didn't want to leave Sodom. And the eye sees what the heart desires, and her heart is there. The Bible says, do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. There's a connection there. Now, listen, when it comes to the heart, you have a heart problem, I have a heart problem, we have a heart problem. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 15, he was being uh, accosted by verbally by the religious leaders saying, why don't your disciples uh, wash their hands before they eat as is the custom of the elders? And he was trying to, to nail Jesus. Jesus, you're not keeping the, the tradition of the elders. He said, well, you're not keeping the commands of God. You've, you've bypassed the commands of God for the tradition of the elders. And then the disciples asked him privately, hey, what is that all about, you know, about washing your hands and, and all that? He said, it's not what enters into a man that defiles a man. It's what comes out of a man that defiles him. He says this, Matthew 15, 19, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. That comes out of the heart. That's in your natural heart. The heart is wicked above all things and desperately sick. Who can know it, Jeremiah says. Here's the good news. When you come to Christ... Ezekiel 36 says this, he'll give you a new heart. He gives you a new heart. He gives you new desires. So you, now you have desires for the things of God, whereas before you didn't, you get a new heart when you come to Christ. You become a new person. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And the Bible says, Romans chapter 6, knowing this, that our old self, our old man, our old heart, so to speak, was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Body of sin might be done away with, might be rendered powerless. That's what it means. The power center for sin in the life of a Christian has been broken. And you don't have to obey the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life anymore. You have a new master, the Lord Jesus, and you can do what he says. Now, here's the thing about your old heart, your old self, your old man, your old nature. It is rendered powerless, but it's not rendered voiceless. And it still barks out commands, and it still wants us to, to go after the things of this world. And, and the things of this world still have a pull. And if you are... Uh, struggling with lust, you know that you see a pretty girl, guys, and, and man, it's, it's hard to turn away. If you struggle with greed, you know, when you hear about a business deal and you, your brain just starts twirling with dollar signs and all this money I can make and all these get-rich-quick schemes, they just seem to attract you. We have all these things that they still pull us. And so when you make this declaration of complete victory over sin and perversity... You're saying with David, I'm not going to walk that way. I'm not going to do those things. Lord, I'm providing the will, but I need you to provide the power. Now, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. So that you may not do the things that you please. 
There's a battle inside of every Christian's heart. A battle between the flesh and a battle between the spirit. The flesh wants to take over. The flesh says, hey, I want to do this. I want to go in this direction. And the spirit is saying, no, we're going in this other direction. And so there's a battle. Who is going to win the battle? I heard about a missionary and he was talking to a, uh, an Indian chief who had recently come to Christ. And he was talking about the battle between the flesh and the spirit. And he asked the, the chief, he said, chief, do you understand what I'm talking about? And he said, yeah. He said, I do. He said, it's almost like inside of me, there's a white dog that wants to do good and a black dog that wants to do bad. And they're fighting each other for control. And the preacher said, well, chief, who wins that battle? He said, it's the one I feed the most. It's the one I feed the most that wins the battle. So there's a need to starve the flesh and feed the new man. I have that need. You have that need. And we need to keep doing it. It's an ongoing thing. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Romans 13, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh with regard to its lusts. That's what David is saying. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. I'm not going to follow in the footsteps of Demas. Remember who Demas was? The Apostle Paul talks about Demas in the last chapter of the last book he ever penned. And he says with a broken heart, Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. He loved the present world. Hey, David says, I'm not going to let that kind of spirit fasten its grip on me. I'm going to walk in the light as he himself is in the light. And hey, when I sin and when I blow it, I'm going to confess it to God and keep walking in the light. See, 1 John chapter 1. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, public life, private life, secret life, all in the light. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin and we can walk with God declare your complete victory over sin and perversity and lastly declare your godly standards for your family and friends godly standards for family and friends this is the manifesto of the kingdom this is the manifesto of the king verse 5 whoever secretly slanders his neighbor him I will destroy no one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way, the way of integrity, is the one who will minister to me. He who practices, practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. David is setting a high bar for his kingdom, for himself, for his family. So let's talk about family first. Let's talk about the home first. Your home needs to be a place of truthfulness and honesty. Listen to me, mom and dad, you need to set the standard for your family that we tell the truth in this house. Debbie and I would tell our girls from the time they were little, listen, if you do something wrong, you disobey, well, that's bad. But if you lie about the disobedience, that lie is way worse than whatever you did. Because if you lie to us, number one, we're going to find out the truth. It's going to come out. But number two, then we can't believe you anymore. Because if you start lying to me, then I don't ever know if you're telling the truth or not. Because you've proven to me that you will tell me a lie. So we tell the truth in our family, we walk in the light in our family and we bring the secret life into the light because the lie is so much worse than whatever the disobedience was. It is critical to have that for your own life and for your family that you tell the truth. Adrian Rogers said he was driving his car one night and he had preached at this place and he knew that he had a taillight 
out in his car, and he was driving, and he got pulled over by a police officer. And the police officer said, son, did you know you had a taillight out? And Adrian said, I have a taillight out? And the guy said, well, evidently he didn't know. Here's just a warning. And he gives him a warning, and Adrian's driving down the road, and the Lord said to Adrian, Adrian, you lied to that officer. He said, no, Lord, I didn't lie. He said, you lied because you deceived him. Because you deceived him. Hey, we can't live like that. We have to live in honesty before the Lord and have our home say, this is a place of truthfulness and honesty. It starts at the home and then it goes into your friendships. Your friends need to be people of godliness and integrity. Godliness and integrity. That's why he says, whoever slanders, secretly slanders his neighbor, him will I silence. No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. Notice the eye and the heart. They go together again. And those aren't people I'm going to put up with in my life, in my kingdom. I'm going to silence those people that are tearing others down with their tongues. And it's the faithful and the blameless. That's the one that's going to minister to me. Now, listen. God wants us to be friendly. God wants us to have lots of friends. And as believers, we need to show the love of Jesus to a lost and dying world. But here's the thing. When it comes to your inner circle of close friends, those people need to be people who are walking with God. Those people, they need to be people who the direction of their life is godliness. They want to grow in the Lord. Hey, declare godly standards for your family and friends. That's what David did. So those four areas of declaration, unwavering allegiance to the Lord, total commitment to a life of integrity, victory over sin and perversity, godly standards for your family and friends. Now, as I close out, here's the thing that I see. So many lives, so many churches, so many people who call themselves Christian. We're not all in. We're kind of partway in. We're kind of on the fence in Christianity. Now, it's not that you're on the fence with regard to who Jesus is. You're on the fence with living it out. And you're, you're going to have one foot in God's kingdom, and you still have one foot in the world, and you're riding the fence. Hey, fences make bad seats. And that's just spiritual compromise. You have to be all in for the Lord. The little couplet says this. They're praising God on Sunday, but they'll be all right on Monday. It's just a little habit they've acquired. And so what do we do? We're all in on Sunday, but then during the week, we go back into the world and we just are kind of like the world and we don't really shine and we don't really share and we're no different from the world. The Lord says, come out from among them and be separate. When I was in college, I had a friend of mine, Mike Bratloff, and we, we used to talk about Christians that were on the fence. He said, you can't be on the fence. How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. You can't be on the fence. Why? Because the devil owns the fence. The devil owns the fence. And if you're a compromiser, God can't use your life like he wants to use you. The devil owns the fence. That's a spiritual lesson. The devil owns the fence. And if you're messing around with the fence, it's going to destroy your life. The time is now to declare, I ain't going down no more. I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to walk in the light. I see himself as in the light. I'm going to start telling the truth, even if it hurts, because I got to get right with him. My friend, I don't know what's going on in your life today, but I know God does and he cares, and he wants to help you. And listen, it all begins with you opening your heart to Jesus. If you've never done that before, I wanna help you with this simple prayer. Just pray with me, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner, and I'm lost, and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, 
to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Today's message, A Declaration of Devotion, is from Pastor Jeff Shreve's new series, Life is Hard, But God is Good. And it's available in multiple formats when you call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. Life is filled with ups and downs. Now, everyone likes the ups and we dread the downs. But in the book of Psalms, God teaches us powerful, life-changing lessons to help us, especially when we face the tough times. Are you struggling in your marriage, in your finances, in your family, in your job, or with some other aspect of life? Well, in my new nine message series on the Psalms, titled, Life is Hard, But God is Good, you'll discover how to experience victory and find spiritual comfort and strength and encouragement for the trials and tribulations that come to every life. It's my gift to you for your support this month to From His Heart. It's available in the format of your choice. God is always good and worthy to be trusted. So I hope you'll request your copy today because life is hard, but God is good. God bless you. This brand new nine message series, along with the companion booklet, Strong Faith for Tough Times from Pastor Jeff, are our gifts of thanks to you for your support this month to From His Heart. The series is available in multiple formats. You can make your gift and request the series when you call 877-777-6171 or go to fromhisheart.org. Thank you for helping From His Heart tell the world that even though life is hard, God is good. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more about that when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real